Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Orgasmic Living. I am your host, Patty Alfonso, creator of the Orgasmic Body Love Experience and Pole Dancing for Consciousness. And I am joined today by one of the most magical, beautiful, creative creatures I have ever had the opportunity to meet. I invited Ashley onto the show because we've had some amazing conversations about orgasmic living, the body, femininity. Ashley is an international, uh, national, international and national emotionally. Em oh my gosh, I'm gonna start that over. Ashley <laughs> is a national emotional analysis and resolution coach, especially for executive men. And I cannot wait to tie into the conversation, the voices and what she knows from working with men into this conversation of what orgasmic living is. Um, I, I love your work, Ashley, and I'm so excited to have you here. So without further ado, everyone welcome Ashley. Hey, <laughs> how you. are you, dear? <laughs> I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation and to take what we usually talk about privately um, public. I know, me too. So let's start off with a question that I am asking everyone on this season of Orgasmic Living. And I just want to let everyone know I, I'm... I'm asking this question because I've realized and become aware of in my work that orgasmic living means something different to everyone. And so I'm on a hunt. I'm on a hunt for all of the different variations of what orgasmic living can look like for a person, what it can look like for their body and in their life. So Ashley, what does orgasmic living mean to you? That's such a great question. I am the kind of person that typically keeps things really succinct. And so what comes through for me is this idea of honoring possibilities. Mm. Yeah, so. <laughs> so more. What does that mean? What, what does that look like for you? <laughs> yeah, I think that we incarnate in this lifetime um, simply to explore to um, find out what's possible for ourselves, to find out what's possible for our society, for the human race, for the earth. Um, we've been given everything we need to create infinitely. And that is, I mean, it's why we experience pain. It's why we experience love. It's why we experience joy. Um, it's simply just methods of creating more, right? So figuring out what we want less of, figuring out what we, what we want more of, and creating that in our life. And so when I think of orgasm, I think of um, obviously the like a child being created, but it can be anything. And so what does that process look like in our lives? Like how do we birth these ideas, these possibilities, these potentials in our personal lives and therefore on a micro level and on a macro level, how do we birth them into the collective when we all bring our intentions together? Um, and for me, what that looks like is being in my body as much as possible. So not disassociating and sitting with the feelings, honoring the feelings and then taking action. Um, I like to think of it as like my masculine is taking action to serve how the feminine wants to feel. And how she wants to feel is what starts to create the new possibilities. Beautiful. Absolutely. Just this is why I wanted to have you on the show. Absolutely beautiful. There are so many delicious gems in what you shared. So the, the words that popped for me, uh, infinite possibility, because I am definitely a woman who is always on the search for what else is available, what else is possible, what else can I can I be here? What else can I do here? So infinite possibility for sure. And then that kind of brought me to one of the things that I talk about a lot with orgasmic living is the willingness, the ability to be present with everything. And that includes the entire spectrum of possibilities, whether they are fun and joyful, or whether they are in the depths of your soul, releasing sorrow or anger or whatever. Um, and the willingness to like really be embodied and present. And I love that you brought up uh, dissociation. I mean, that's really what brought me to this work, right? Was my dissociation and disconnection from my own body. 
And when I started really diving into this work on a, on a personal level, I just, it's like, you can't experience life on this planet fully unless you're really fully, fully connected in communion with and in total adoration and admiration with your body, right? Because everything on this planet is really for our bodies. So I love that you talked about both of those, like the infinite possibilities, right? When we look at energy and what else is available, and then also enjoying all of those possibilities with your body. Beautiful. Um, you talked about the masculine and the feminine. So let's dive let's dive into that a little bit let me see can you repeat what you said about the masculine and the feminine you said it was like the masculine taking action on yeah serving how the feminine wants to feel so in life when it comes to like men and women and within our own internal polarity of our own masculine and feminine the masculine is designed to respond to how the feminine feels and um so it's a matter of like if I can check in with myself and feel all the stuff that doesn't feel good, then I can start to create possibilities for what I do want to experience, right? And then my masculine is in service of that. So he's the one that takes action to create the systems and structures, opportunities to clear the way, um, to, to facilitate the direction that my life needs to go in. And, and he's the one that's willing to make those really hard decisions. And I'm talking about my internal masculine, right? Um, to make those really hard decision, decisions that need to be made that aren't led by, it, they're led by emotion, but not led by emotion, right? So like, if I want to experience, um, let's say, what's a good one? Like, if I want to experience more time in my schedule, well, my inner masculine would be the one that would clear the path through that. So maybe I need to have some conversations with clients about how, um, I'm changing my schedule, right? So he's not worried about, um, he doesn't get stopped by other people's feelings and like the, the limitations and the contractions. He pushes forward, he makes it happen, he's present, he's aware, there's a focus, there's a direction, and it's all to clear the way to be in service of um, a greater vision or something more, something else that's possible that I'm wanting to feel. Mm -hmm. And in those moments, since you're distinctively talking about, you know, your inner masculine and your inner feminine, in those moments, I'm curious what the inner feminine is experiencing, being present with, like when your masculine's paving the way for what she actually desires. In that, what's the inner feminine doing? I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah, I'd say it's pretty chaotic, actually. Yeah. Right? Like... Yeah. I mean, it dep depends on like the day. <laughs> yes, chaotic. And I want to just take the stigma away from that word um, because the energy of chaos can also be the energy of creativity. The energy of chaos, we can find it in nature all of the time. Like chaos to me is, is this explosive energy that is creative and generative and that goes with the flow of what is happening, right? So we say chaos and people are like, oh no, chaos is terrible. We must order everything and control everything. No, <laughs> you wanna have all of that available to you, right? Um, so yeah, it can be pretty, it can be pretty chaotic. So let's talk about that, the feminine and chaos. Um, and I was, I don't remember if I mentioned this in the last interview, but we're gonna go here again because it's present. Uh, the feminine, chaos, which can sometimes also be labeled as like crazy, mm -hmm. right? But I think that that label comes from a, a patriarchal structure that doesn't actually understand or have a sense for what the feminine really is. Um, so so let, what does that bring up for you? Like when I, where are you at with all this? <laughs> it, it brings up an image of labor, like childbirth. Mm -hmm. Mm. <laughs> like, yeah. right? It's like you, there. <laughs> yeah. Like it, it's this paradox of pain and love. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, uh, there's literal like physical injury and yet it's worth it and it's sacrificial. And like, that is chaotic. Like that paradox of all these, um, 
uh, seemingly opposite things happening at the same time. Um, and, and yeah, I think it happens in life too, right? And that goes back to your point of us women and everyone ideally because men have a feminine side too, like being willing to sit with that pain. Um, the thing that gets like tricky in relationships is when the pain gets directed and comes off as um, like oh, the woman is trying to hurt the other person, right? Like I'm hurting or man, we all do it. Like I'm hurting, so I want you to hurt because I want you to, I don't feel like you're empathizing. So I'm forcing you to empathize by making you feel how I feel. That's, I think, where people get really, they start to get scared of the emotion because a lot of times um, what they think is the emotion is actually someone's resistance to the emotion. What is much more safe is us actually just being willing to sit with it, express it in a healthy way. Um, to know what to do with that and to have the capacity to um, embody that emotion without displacing it on to someone else. You know, one of, when, so when you, you, you're saying to sit with it, to sit with it, and I want to expand on that for people listening. First of all, um, gosh, so many beautiful things. So when you say sit with it, what, for me, it's about being willing to be present mm-hmm. with it with all of the nuances of whatever the energy is that's coming up. So, and and I think that we all on some level have that capacity to take things out on our partner, right? It's as out of reaction, out of resistance, out of, you know, so so for for those of you out there listening where you're like, oh my God, I've totally done that. Please do not go into, I'm a terrible person. Let's not go there right? We all have the capacity to do that. Even in our best moments, even in the most secure relationships that exist out on this planet, they have those moments too. The lesson, the growth, right, is like Ashley is saying, to be able to sit with that energy, be present with it. And I want to add to that, that it's creating the space for you to make a different choice in that moment. I've had moments in my partnership where like, I wanna do something to like get back at them. I'm hurt, they're not listening, they're not doing what I want them to do, so I'm gonna do this just to, right? I've had those moments, we've all had them. And I notice that energy arise within me. I am present with that energy and I allow myself and I create the space to make a different choice because that's really what it's about. When you're on autopilot and you let that energy consume you and consume your body and then drive your next choice, that's when we get into, you know, difficulties in our relationships. There's nothing wrong with that energy. There's nothing wrong with that impulse, right? It's just an initial, right? Wherever it comes from, whether it's trauma or whatever that underlying stuff is, that's for each individual to sort of figure out and sort through. And I think that it is in that sorting of like, okay, what is this and where is this coming from? Then, okay, I can actually make a different choice. Who do I want to be? Who do I want to be in this relationship? Who do I want to be? How do I want to show up? Period. Regardless of what the the problem is or the, the argument or whatever, it's just like, okay, I'm noticing this energy. Oh, I'm noticing I really want to react. I really, okay. And just allowing that energy to flow through your body, however that works for you, whether it's through movement or running, walking, painting, beating up a phone book, whatever you need to do to move that energy, right? That's more sort of like contained and not directed at someone else. And then allowing yourself the space to make a different choice. We're talking about like, you know, neural pathways being rewired, you know, I'm I'm simplifying the process. (laughs) But that's really, really what we're looking at. I I wish we would all do more of that inner self work that it takes to really show up different in relationships, in our partnerships, at work, you know, whatever. Yeah. On that, my dear. I, I love this. And I actually have some kind of uncond- unconventional uh, methods of getting that stuff out of my system. And um, Are they? tell us, tell us. Yeah. yeah. At, at the risk of sounding like a psychopath, I will. Um, I'll do it for the people. 
I'll share mine when you share yours too. <laughs> I mean, to, to your point too, I mean, I'm definitely guilty of trying to displace that energy onto someone else. Um, and that goes back to my own childhood trauma of not being seen and heard. And I mean, that stuff gets really, really deep for me. And so as it does for a lot of people, um, and it's why I love doing this work, because I feel like if I could climb out of the crazy, crazy aspects of um, how I was trained, then <laughs> I can help other people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is this what you're talking about has been key in my own transformation. Um, it's funny because it's the last thing most people want to do. So instead of feeling our feelings, we scroll, we drink, oh, right? Like we have we develop different addictions. Uh, we'll do anything to. I think that all of those things are distractions. Distractions mm-hmm. from just like it take it. The uncomfortable sensation will pass so much faster if you just be with it, sit with it allow it, be present with it, that suppression, and then coming out sideways. Then you go to Instagram or you go to Facebook or, you know, I mean, exercise can also serve that purpose. Eating can serve that purpose of distraction. Uh, Sometimes my business is my distraction. Well, I'm just gonna work. Well, I'm really mad, so I'm just gonna write a book. (laughs) That's how I do it. Um, You know, eating, shopping, uh, there's so, whatever is happening in the world at the moment can serve as a distraction. So I'm sorry, I cut you off. Go on with your special but different <laughs> ways of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're spot on. I think that we, on one hand, want to try to regulate and calm ourselves with, you know, the food or whatever it is. Um, on, the, on another hand, on, on the other hand, we could be escaping or negating or neglecting that emotion or that feeling. And so um, what I have found is, you know, not sitting with those feelings and instead displacing them onto my partner almost ended my relationship. I mean, this is someone that I've known for almost 20 years. He uh, waited to date me for 15 until I got my act together and finally decided to, you know, choose him. And um he obviously loves me so much and and my temper um really i mean we did we actually did break up for nine months um because because of it and then he'd be avoidant and so we had these really dysfunctional patterns and the thing that broke not only broke those patterns but started a significant new phase of my healing process was uh, i would start by writing how i was feeling in my in the notes of my phone instead of sending it to him mm-hmm. so yeah. Part of, and, and it didn't have to be on my phone. I mean, it could have been a piece of paper, but I'm a millennial, so it's my phone. Um, so I'd open the notepad and I would, you know, like, I can't stand you, you know, like what, whatever it is. I can't believe you said this or said that. And sometimes that would escalate into um, full on like a physical, I'm like punching a pillow. Uh, one time I um, was like hitting this box and I took some scissors to the box. Like I just, and I just realized that there was basically it becomes this um, a volcanic eruption almost of energy and it's repressed anger from years and years and years of my boundaries being violated as a child being abused as a child having no voice as a child and i had to repress that sense of like indignance and um, just how i was feeling and so my boyfriend um you know, he was triggering those things within me, like whatever, whatever small thing it was. I mean, typically it was really insignificant, but it would trigger that old material. And so I'd let it, let it come out. I've, I've learned now that it doesn't actually have to be physical, although that's where this started for me. Um, what I might do now is like go into a meditation. Um, a couple of months ago, I was angry about something. And so I just sat at my kitchen table and I kind of went into a meditation in my mind where I was imagining I had a sword and I was just cutting everyone in half that had ever hurt me. <laughs> like, I don't know, I was just like picturing, and these are, some of them are people that I love, right? But like what I wanted or felt like doing to them when they hurt me as a child or whatever, and I forgave them and I wanted to be in connection with them or in relationship with them. Some of the people I have no desire to ever see again. Um, I, you know, it's, but I would just, I just went in and it took maybe, I don't even know how the time just kind of passed, but it wasn't that long. And then I felt better. 
And then I went on about my day, right? And like there was, that's all it took to have a shift in my beingness and in my body to have a release of that energy. And what's really interesting is when I let those volcanic eruptions happen, like you said, in a contained way, whatever that looks like, um, they don't really come back. Like it's literally letting it out and letting it out and letting it out until it's just kind of gone. And um, I, I find that I i don't get triggered about the same things once I finally get to the bottom of that energy. Something that I'll tell my clients, um, and I'd love to talk about how this applies to men in, in just a second, but something I'll tell them is to like chop wood and pretend like they're chopping someone's head off if they're really mad at someone or whatever, um, just to just to get it out. And as, as violent and as psychotic as that might sound, I would rather sound crazy and tell people to do things that sound crazy than for them to actually be crazy and turn into, you know, to develop mental health issues or um, to ruin their relationships or make decisions that ruin their life. Like, let's just let's just be real about the fact that we all um, feel a little crazy sometimes and find productive, healthy ways to um, move that through our body. And so we can get back to homeostasis, baseline, you know, neutrality, et cetera. Yeah, for sure. Look, I, I mean, I've been on this journey 15, I, more than that at this point. And I also had a very uh, controlling family growing up and there was a lot of rage, uh, hidden rage in, in our family, a lot of abuse, a lot of alcoholism. Um, and I also grew up having to suppress all of that energy right? Because it was okay for my dad to rage, but if I raged, then I was a bad, bad little girl, right? So, so there was a suppression of energy that at some point, like energy, emotion, energy in motion, right? Energy needs to move. It is the, the, the flow of life. It needs to continuously be in movement. And when we suppress that, it gets locked into our bodies. And so I have also, I'm, one time I think I took a set of plates that I was going to throw away. And instead of throwing them away, I went into the woods and I just like smashed them on trees. Um, I have taken scissors to phone books. I have ripped up phone books. And when that energy comes up, instead of suppressing it, just like you're saying, finding ways to continue to move it so that it doesn't get stuck and locked in. Cause I got it like, that is not orgasmic living, right? You want to have a healthy spectrum of all energies moving through your body and your life and your being at all time. And when you suppress that, then it gets locked in. That's when you start getting stiff and when you start like developing ailments and diseases and, and all that kind of stuff. So I also highly recommend for those of you listening, if you do not have any experience with this kind of release, uh, find a professional that can walk you through this and presence this with you because I all think it I also think it's really important to be witnessed because we were sometimes so ignored and devalued I think it's really important to be witnessed in our rage and to be witnessed in our anger like those those energies aren't wrong or bad either when they are um, experienced in a healthy manner they are indicators that something's off that's all it is. It is an indicator that something is off. A boundary has been violated. Uh, something's happening that's not working for you. And being really attuned to the energies that arise and being able to be present with them and sit with them is what's going to give you information about what actually really does work for you and for your life. And I, you know, I'm, I'm someone, and I do this with my clients all the time. Like I've got a, I've got a rage playlist and when I'm having that energy, man, I put on my playlist and I dive into some really deep hip circles. Uh, and I, I, I have to continue using my body to, to move that energy. There are times like if I'll do tapping or I'll go into meditation, like all of those things work for everyone listening. Find the thing that works for you. For me, for me, it's just dance and movement. It's just, that's how I keep my body healthy and alive and feeling everything and all the good things, right? Uh, 
you know, when you suppress, when you suppress, no matter what it is that you're suppressing, you know, we think, oh, well, let me put this anger away. But if you put that anger away, you're also putting a part of your joy away. You're also putting a part of your um, happiness away. Orgasmic living is about experiencing everything in a really healthy, nurturing kind of way. And so energy always has to be moving, always in motion. So yeah, I'm, I'm quite familiar. And I don't think it's crazy. I don't think it's crazy that you got to like rip up a book, uh, a phone. God, do we even have phone books anymore? Totally. Uh, <laughs> no. I, I don't think so. I mean, people might throw a phone. Back in the day when I was young, <laughs> we used to have phone books. And then I would get mad and I would <laughs> <laughs> whatever you know encyclopedias we don't have those anymore damn um anyway i digress with my with my funniness i i love this i love this conversation and and in moving that energy that is really when orgasmic energy becomes available in your body and in your life so you had mentioned about how you wanted to talk about this impacting men. And I really want to dive into this conversation. I, I have worked with men, but I mostly work with women and the feminine and the chaos and the crazy and all of that and taking the judgment away from all of that. Um, so, so tell me how, t tell me about this in regards to men. I just heard a quote this morning from Sheila Kelly, and she said that two things that this society tries to control is men's i'm gonna not quote her accurately but men's anger men's rage and women's femininity and sensuality hmm. so I'm, curious, I'm curious what you know about all of this given you know the work that you do yeah so the suicide rate of men is almost four times that of women did you know that they um, have a lower life expectancy and they have more heart issues, um, things like that, blood pressure issues. Um, so the reason, in my opinion, one of the biggest, biggest reasons, and this isn't something that's like, you know, coming from peer reviewed research, right? But this is just common sense to me, honestly, based on what I see with my guys is that they are repressing and suppressing their emotions because we have not made it socially acceptable for them to express. It is viewed as uh, a weakness. It's viewed as they're not able to handle something. It is viewed as, you know, they are less than or they're not a strong enough man. They're not man enough. And it goes back to those um, phrases we use with them as children, right? Like, be a man or boys don't cry, right? Um, get over it like that. It's a like gaslighting. We gaslight our young men and make them think that there's something wrong with their emotions. Like you shouldn't, they shouldn't feel the way that they're feeling. They shouldn't express it the way they're expressing it. Um, their tears are feminine somehow and um, therefore mean something about their masculinity. And so they grow up being men that are expected to protect their at all costs, even if it means giving their life for our country, etc. They are expected to provide at all costs, even if it means working 100 hours a week. Um, and they are not allowed to have feelings about any of that. So not only do we expect you to uh, go fight for our country and possibly die or watch your friends die, but you're not allowed to cry about it. Right. Oh, well, yeah. And, and then, I mean, that's think about, um, we all know the veteran suicide rate is you know or even active duty suicide rate is really high i think 22 it was 22 men dying every day um, who are military or previous military and so that is kind of the symbol or like a microcosm of or like the paradox um these two opposing things that we tell the men embodied in one kind of uh, archetype like this warrior archetype, right? Um, so all men experience that, but we can see it very clearly and kind of in a hyperbolic way with soldiers who are expected to go do these um, incredible tasks and sometimes, you know, life altering, make life altering decisions and um, 
but then not have feelings about it. I have so many men that come to me and say, like, I feel guilty for surviving because all of my friends died Mm -hmm. and they are frozen or kind of stuck in time um, when it comes to proceeding with their life or moving forward with their life because they haven't been given permission to even begin to process that. And even if they had the permission, we haven't taught them the tools to process that. And then even if they had the permission and the tools, the brain still might even struggle like to try to understand um, because it's such a high level of like, you know, craziness. It's like, I don't even know if I can get my, I mean, it's kind of like when our children are sexually assaulted, like how do we even begin to wrap our mind around certain things? But to not only be confronted with absolute madness, but not be allowed to process it or given the tools to process it, you're just compounding the madness into a, an impossible expectation um, for our men. And when you add a woman's emotions on top of it, of course, you know, when we're co regulating and she's freaking out about something and he's feeling that, he is going to shut down because his body subconsciously has been trained and programmed not to feel his feelings. And when she starts to feel her feelings, he's going to feel that in his body because we're all co-regulating. And what does he do? He's going to shut down or he's going to blow up to try to contain or control the situation because he immediately has a subconscious belief around what those emotions or feelings mean about him as a person. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed that a lot in my partnership, I find myself saying, this, this isn't about you, actually. Yeah, not, I'm not making you wrong. I'm not, this isn't actually about you. (laughs) This is about me and what's going on in my inner world. You know, Um, it's interesting, Ashley, what comes up because um, around what you're saying that I'd like to know more about So we have this, gosh, so many things. I think, oh my gosh, so many things. Which one wants to come out of my mouth right now? (laughs) For one thing, I think this is where the definition of masculine and feminine doesn't serve us. When we've defined what masculinity is and we've defined what femininity is, I think this is where we totally stick ourselves and make ourselves wrong. that, that was kind of the first thing that popped. And my question is because I have heard uh, one of the, the pillars of being, you know, a really masculine man and really in your divine masculine is actually the ability to uh, be present with the storm of the feminine and not react and not respond. And I'm trying to like, sort of make that make sense with what you're saying. Uh, And I'm sort of like, (laughs) does that make sense? Yeah, I think if it's perfectly actually, I mean, so the masculine is presence. Mm -hmm. Like the divine masculine is presence. That's just what it is. And it's everything you're saying. Like it's, I, and that's the thing too, when you think about girls that have daddy issues and like they have so much trauma around that. Like I, get to retrain myself to be able to be present with and contain my emotions. That's my inner masculine holding my emotions as they come out. Right. Right. And I didn't have that as a child. And so I had to retrain myself to be present with my emotions and hold my emotions. And, um, that implies that we have made it acceptable for men to be present with their emotions or our emotions or their children's emotions and we haven't so yes i agree like it's very healthy but we there's another step there that we're missing and i'm i'm getting that now like what what i'm hearing you say is that we you know we we actually really do train women to be present with their emotions and to feel and that's like a a traditional feminine thing and what i'm hearing now with more clarity is that we actually which i mean i know this we actually train men to not feel that it's not okay to feel that they're not allowed to feel. So I'm really curious about what it would look like 
for a masculine to hold presence and feel at the same time. Is mm -hmm. that sort of, is that like some of the work that you do with the men that you work with? Like how do they hold presence and be present and still feeling, I mean, that's what I've been practicing in my own life uh, for many, 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 many years. <laughs> Lots of practice. <laughs> Lots of practice. And I'm so, you know, I'm so, for many years, I've always been like, who's working with the men? Who's, who, I know I'm doing my work. I've got my feminine, you know, campfire, my mentors that are helping me and da, da, da. who's working with the men? Who's helping the men? So here you are. I'm so <laughs> glad. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Me too. I love it. And and there are people, but it's not nearly as popular as like women's coaching or women going to therapy, um, that kind of thing. And then when you add race on top of it, there are, uh, I mean, it's socially acceptable for white, let's, let's be clear, white women to go to therapy and um, men like white now most of my clients are white men and I would love to change that and I've talked to my friends about it I've talked to my boyfriend about it who's who's mixed like there's this stigma that there's an added stigma um around cultures that are not white especially uh, I'd say well I'd say both um black and latino cultures like I'm just gonna say look I'm Puerto Rican I'm yeah. half Puerto Rican half Cuban therapy was like uh, no, you don't discuss your problems with other people. You don't tell people what's really going on. Uh, it was definitely, it took me a long time to be able to just open up and be vulnerable because that wasn't okay. We had to have like the picture of perfection kind of family. And, you know, my dad had this one persona at home that was grumpy and rageful and drunk and whatever, but his outside persona was like, everybody loved him. You know, I was always really confused by that. I'm like, who are you guys talking about? That's not the dad I know, <laughs> you know, um, amazing. Crazy. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I just wanted to like drop that in here. Um, but my point is that like we haven't made it acceptable we haven't made it socially acceptable um for men and then there are even other more layers to that when you combine other factors socioeconomic race all of that um and so yeah i mean there are there are men helping men there are some women helping men um but by far it is very socially acceptable for specifically white women to get coached and go to therapy and, you know, do, do whatever it is that we've been doing. It's so much fun and it's so great. And, and this medicine is for everyone. And so I'm really happy also that I, um, I think maybe it's one of the reasons I've incarnated, right? Like at least that's where I'm at in my life right now is bringing that medicine through for the masculine. Um, and I think your original question was like, what does that look like? Is that correct? I think that's what you're asking me. I forgot. <laughs> I think, okay, so so I did have an answer for that. So um, a, a real-time answer there, or a real example. So one of my clients from, uh, well, I won't say where he's from, just for his own privacy, but he was a, he's a hypnotherapist, a very popular hypnotherapist. And um, you would think that he'd have this stuff mastered, uh, but meditation is not the same thing as somatic embodiment of mm -hmm. your emotions and your feelings. And he would voxer me or send me over a message and say, well, I was really upset this morning, but don't worry. I meditated for an hour and then I was like, kind of okay. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So, <laughs> yeah. Right. So really he was angry. He was very, very angry at his partner. She was reflecting back to him his unwillingness to sit with some deeper emotions and maybe his lack of awareness that they were even there. So what we ended up finding was that there was some childhood things that I would call it like little T trauma, right? Trauma that kind of gets, um, it slips under the radar. And so we don't even know it's there. Trauma, I just want to, for everyone listening, I don't mean to interrupt you, but trauma is also on a spectrum. You know, that can be for someone like me, who's really, really energetic, like someone shooting me a dirty look 
across the room it is traumatic for my system for my nervous system and that spectrum can go all the way to you know car accidents physical abuse like we've also defined trauma in certain ways but so sorry i did, i just wanted to put that out there for people listening so go ahead yeah any trauma is that and, that's and, not the word you used yeah like in his case his mom um went to work and he didn't understand like he had needs that weren't met and she left the door he saw her ride away on her bike and that was traumatic for him and he didn't even realize that that was related to some of the problems in his relationship. And there were other things, obviously, but that was kind of an example of that came up in a meditation. Um, a, it wasn't just like a clear your mind meditation. It was like go into the pain meditation, like sit with that energy and those emotions and feel it. So my point is that he had stuff in there. It was coming up in his relationship. His partner was reflecting back to him his unwillingness to, she was poking and prodding, right? Like one, where are your boundaries? He wasn't in his power. And two, he wasn't allowing himself to feel. And she kept holding up a mirror to that. And it was so frustrating to him. And I said, okay, look, go on a hike. And I want you to like figure out a way to let this stuff out. So he went on a hike. He screamed out over a lake, why don't you get it? And he, the words were meant for his girlfriend because he loved her so much. He didn't understand why she wasn't reciprocating, why she wasn't where he was, where, you know, like, et cetera, why she was being difficult. He thought he was a great catch, and he was. He's like, what is happening here? And so he yelled that out. He had a flashback from when he was a child, and he realized it was actually towards his mother, like that energy or anger came from his mother. He sent me a message later, and he said, I'm so glad that no one else was there to witness that because even I was judging myself for feeling those emotions and for letting them out. And I thought, that's what it is. It's that... Men have a subconsciously programmed, like, there's a guilt and a shame around, especially the shame around feeling their feelings, letting their emotions out, displaying them so much so that it's not even about other people seeing it. It's like they are judging themselves for having feelings, right? Like, yeah, I mean, and, and that's, I mean, so that's what it would look like for a man to be present with whatever emotions. He created a container for it. He went on a hike. He yelled out over the lake. He structured that whole thing. And then once he created that container and that structure, he let it out and even sat with the feeling of shame and judgment around, around it. Yeah. yeah, it's almost like, um, not almost i think it is i don't i don't think that men have permission to be vulnerable with themselves and with their partners i i was saying this to someone the other day like how uh i feel like like you tell me if you if you see this in your clients like 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 men I've noticed in some men this sort of the like white lies, right? Little white lies because they'd rather tell you a white lie than deal with the reaction and the response. We mm -hmm. haven't really, as the feminine, haven't really allowed the space for the masculine to just be the masculine. Like I always tell my boyfriend, I'm like, look, you are a good looking man. Women are gonna be attracted to you. They are, that's okay. And it's also okay if you're attracted to other women. I'm, I look at other bodies and I think they're attractive and they're yummy and whatever, you know? And But I've set the boundary of like, it's fine until you go have a secret lunch with someone that would be a problem for me, right? It's it, like that attraction, that energy, it's, it's healthy. It's okay until you cross X, Y, Z boundary. These are the boundaries that I have, you know? Um, and I love him so much, but he, I can feel it in his body when he has that energy come up for him towards someone else that he's trying to hide it from me, you know, because he does it, he thinks, thinks that I'm just going to like freak out. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I freak out when there's a lie because I'm super psychic. 
And I know that you're lying, but I may not know exactly why you're lying, but I know that there's a lie. And that's the energy that escalates me, you know? So we're in this dance of him learning that it's safe, that it's okay for attraction to be alive in his body, right? Um, but I, I, I feel like, and I've seen this, you know, a lot that there's just, we haven't given men permission to just be vulnerable and be men. Um, and I think that that's part of, and it's interesting because I was doing a ceremony. I was in ceremony. I think you and I might have talked about this, but one of the times that we talked, I was in ceremony and my heart was just like so open and really feeling like the divine essence of the feminine and the masculine. And my heart was hurting for the masculine, to be honest. And I had this like, maybe I should be working with the masculine instead of working with women and the feminine. And in that very split second, I had that awareness of like, no, the work that you're doing with women and with the feminine is going to help the masculine. So like I'm present with the masculine, but I'm sort of like a roundabout kind of way. And I work with women on just like really just being an allowance of the men in their lives and the things. And, and it's just, it's really interesting. It's, I think relationships are probably one of the most kind of complicated things. You know, they push your buttons, they bring up childhood wounds, and then, you know, you get all into your defenses and then just your defenses are talking to each other. And it takes, I think, so much um, self-love and self-discipline to really invite the divine whether it's masculine, feminine, or whatever, into your life and into your relationship. It's a practice. It's a practice for sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, there were, so, so what you said about helping the man by working with women is how I feel about helping men or working with men is that I'm helping the women um, kind of inadvertently because if the men can sit with their emotions, if the men can be present, if the men can be in their power, then the women feel safer and are in fact safer to express, to be, um, to let it out, et cetera, you know, because the men aren't having an avoidance, avoidant response or shutting down um, when that stuff comes up for her. And instead he knows, well, I'm not gonna take this personally. This isn't about me. Um, he can set boundaries and provide that container for her. So her anger and whatever else doesn't hurt herself or him or someone else. Right. So I would say that's every man. If, if there's a, if there are men listening, like, don't be afraid to set boundaries around how she expresses her emotions. Like, I want to know how you feel. Right. But here are the parameters around that, because feminine rage can it can destroy worlds. And so a lot of times men just don't know what to do with that. They like, obviously like, I'm scared. I'm going to shut down. Whoa. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm, it's like a self-preservation thing at that point. Um, so he can actually set boundaries around that for her and enforce those boundaries and be present with her. And one thing that, for example, my partner does for me is when I'm feeling upset, he's very attuned. So he'll notice a change in my body language and my posture and my eye contact, whatever it is, my energy, my tone of voice. And he'll say, um, you know, what do you need right now? And I don't always have an answer because that's kind of a foreign question. Like I'm working on asking myself that. Um, but to have someone else ask me that is like, wait, what? Especially a man, like what? <laughs> you know? And so sometimes I'll have to repeat it. Like, no, seriously, what do you need right now? And it takes me a minute to even believe that he's willing to deliver Again, goes back to that childhood stuff. And so once, for example, one time I told him his friend was coming over and there's a story behind that. I said, well, can we just go to bed at the same time? And he was like, yeah, no problem. And then we had a great time and there were, I, it immediately halted any anything that was about to pour out of me. Um, I felt safe. I felt seen. I felt heard. And that was like his way of acknowledging getting ahead of the emotion, acknowledging the emotion, telling me it was important. There was something else that I um, wanted to add. I was just like, I got caught up in listening to. 
say you know, what you're saying. Yeah. I've been caught up in listening to you too. I'm like, oh, what's she saying? Wait, what? <laughs> That's why I love you. That's why I love having these conversations with you because there, there's an ease in in how we connect and talk and the places that we can go. And it, it's infinite. It's infinite the places that we could go. But I'll let I'll let you tap in and and see what else you wanted to say. Yeah. Okay. I remember now. Thank you for giving me that space. <laughs> so it was about um, this integrity piece. You said white lies and I immediately went to integrity. So integrity is one of my, maybe the highest value I have for myself and my clients. It's the highest value for the masculine I can think of. For the feminine, Obviously, it's important for us to be in integrity with the majority of things going on in our life. Like, like you said, we're we're monogamous. If that's what we what we what we've agreed to, right? Like, women have a masculine inside of them too, and that piece does need to be in integrity. However, our moods, our feelings change depending on whatever way that the wind is blowing. And so, one minute we might feel like we want hamburgers, and it's not a lie if we actually changed our mind and say, you know what? Actually, I want sushi. Um, that's not a breach of integrity. It's just us being us. And so I want to add that caveat. That, 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 like when you were talking about when your boyfriend asks you what you need, I've often, sometimes like in those moments when I'm having a, like what, what you were describing, there are times when what I would need is to be touched. And there are times when you should not come near me. So I can't even give him that sort of blanket. Well, if you just put your arms around me, I'm like, mm, that's, not, that's a blanket statement I can't stick to. <laughs> so yes, that is how the feminine kind of works. <laughs> yeah, I think the key word there is like right now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's, there's not like a, well, when I'm feeling like this, then I want you to do this. It's like, the masculine gets to check in and say, what do you need right now? Um, because be, the, due to the nature of the chaos of the emotion, we just never know what's what dynamics are happening. It literally right. changes like every 10 seconds. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. Literally, I don't know about you, but, but wait, you were talking about integrity and white lies. Yeah. So I want you to finish that, that thought. Yeah. So... Um, Basically, the masculine really, really, really gets to be an integrity. And I have been working more and more with this archetype of the nice guy. And what I find is that um, the it's not about, for me, I guess it's important not to lie to your partner, not to have these white lies. But the primary concern for me in my work with men is that they aren't lying to themselves and that they are in integrity with themselves. And they're not, you know, having these white lies with themselves. They're not gaslighting themselves um, because what happens is they abandon themselves to serve the emotions of someone else. So they're actually more attuned to uh, their partner. And again, it's natural for the man to respond to a woman's emotions. But this is like taking this is a trauma response right. when, the, when the man is more concerned about how she is feeling than how he is feeling to the point where he abandons himself. And what most people don't realize is like women actually don't respond well to nice guys for not all nice guys, but a lot of nice guys for this reason. There is an integrity breach when he is abandoning his own authenticity for the sake of her approval. And she's going to feel that in her body. And he cannot for the life of him understand why he can quote unquote do everything right or check all the boxes and she still doesn't want him. It's like, well, because sir, you are not being authentic. You're not sharing your authentic and raw and powerful and vulnerable truth with the world, much less with her. And so she can't trust the connection because she is essentially connecting with a, a, a stereotype or an archetype or a ghost or a uh, blueprint and not an actual human being who's really in his power and really done his work and really present um, and really authentic and unapologetic about it. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like, um, like, like. I hate to use this word, but here we go. It's kind of like a castration, where they're just, where do you need me? Where do you want me? And that's what I'm going to do without any sort of self. You know, what do I want right now? What do I need right now? I mean, I think it, we all you know, we've just been so trained to, we're just so disconnected from ourselves 
you know, in general, what I see out, you know, with my clients and with people and it, unless you're really, really, really into this like personal development thing, <laughs> you're kind of really not connected to what you really want. You're living your life based on other people's expectations and other people's projections. And that never creates anything. And it certainly doesn't create like living orgasmically. Uh, and this, I, I love this, this nice guy, you know, thing that you kind of have, go, that you have going on now. I, I've seen, I've known you for a while. So this is this iteration today. And I, I really do appreciate, um, because it, I think it's, it's true in a sense, uh, you know, who, it also feels like when the guys go into the nice guy thing and they're not showing up fully for themselves or for the relationship, it kind of destroys polarity in the relationship. You know, I know myself, like I, I own my own business and I, I, I'm very in my masculine a lot of the time, uh, building and creating and, and, and all of that. I don't want to be in that when I get home. I don't want to be in that in the bedroom. I don't want to, you know, I, I really need that presence and that like, sometimes my boyfriend looks at me and I just look like I'm done, <laughs> you know, and sometimes not there's both, uh, as there are in any, any, any relationships. Um, yeah, I think it destroys polarity. And, and if the feminine or the woman always has to be in charge and always has to be making the decisions and always, you know, they may think that they're happy in that way, but that's that's a woman in a woman's body acting like a man, <laughs> which can't possibly be. <laughs> Anyway, we, I, I feel like you and I could go on forever and ever and ever. Um, and I would love to have you back on the show. I know that we are getting to our time here, so I don't want to start any new topics. Uh, but I feel like we could talk for hours and hours. I know that you have a free gift and I have a free gift as well. So what is your free gift, Miss Ashley? And then we'll put the link to the free gift somewhere around the video, around the blog, around the podcast, wherever, wherever people are finding us. Yeah, so the free gift is called the Nice Guy Accelerator. It's a series of seven videos where I take them through the process of answering a lot of the main questions that men have around women, right? So how do I open up and trust again after being hurt? How do I toxic proof my bedroom and tr attract the right women and repel the wrong women? Um, what else do I have in there? Just all kinds of all kinds of really juicy questions that I get asked all the time and each video is dedicated to the questions and when you look at the landing page the question is on the thumbnail of the of the video so you'll be able to see which videos you want to watch or you can watch all of them Beautiful. and we will put the link to that along with this video and this audio so that you guys can find it. And for me, I would love to gift everyone the six keys to living an orgasmic life. For me, that's all about embodiment and being with your body and being present with everything. And it's not what you think, you know, it's not like sex tips in the bedroom. I like to pull the energy of orgasm out of the bedroom, have it in your everyday life. And then trust me, when you put it back into the bedroom, it's gonna be greater than anything you could have imagined. So that link is pattyalfonso.sexy slash free gift. And we'll get you Ashley's link. Ashley, thank you so, so, so much for being here with me today. I, I, we're we're going to have you back on at some point because there's just so much more to talk about. <laughs> but thank you for sharing your brilliance and your wisdom. And I'm so grateful that you are in the world doing the work that you do because um, someone needs to be there for the men, for sure. Thank you for having me, Patty. I've really enjoyed this conversation and I would be happy to come back anytime. Yay, I adore you. Bye everyone. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.